Okay, you've seen the resin printed arcader bodies, the clear, the Cerakote, the 3D printed, and the Hydra Dip. Today we're CNC milling a wooden body for the Arcator 3 handheld. Through this process I'll share how I modeled, jigged, and defined the milling operations to produce this one of a kind enclosure that, well, just makes you feel good. Stick around. Now this isn't my first video on wooden handhelds and probably won't be the last. You've probably seen my other videos so I'll spare you the details. If you're interested in learning more about the Arcator, I've put a link in the description below. To set the context, let's talk about the body's design. For that, let's dive into Fusion 360. Looking at the internal components of the system, they're all stacked into a nice compact assembly. The assembly was designed to be seated inside the body and retained by a compression seal on the acrylic face. Nice, clean, and simple. As with most designs, simple and elegant are usually difficult and complicated to execute. In this case, there are a lot of small ledges and clearances necessary to properly support and align the assembly within the body. Of course, I could have cut a lot of corners to simplify this, but this channel is about making production grade prototypes. So what do you do? Start with a solid body and start removing material until it fits? That may work, and I've done that a couple times, but with parametric modeling, I find that you drive the internal design to a level of complexity that's difficult to manage. And at that point, reworking or changing the design becomes a nightmare. I call it design lock-in. You're so customized into a specific design that it becomes immutable. Listen, design always evolves, nothing is final, and setting yourself up to buffer change is an obvious win. This is something you have to manage with the cumulative nature of parametric modeling. So in this case, one way to go about it is to model the negative space, the space which the component assembly occupies, the tolerances, the mount points, and any ports and vents. A model of the negative space can then be used as a tool to perform a Boolean operation on the solid body. Make sense? This gives you the flexibility to manage the internal structures with little dependency on the design of the enclosure. They're basically handled as separate objects. Once complete, a section analysis allows me to validate the results and tune the design as needed. And by that I mean making sure the design is able to be created with the capabilities of the manufacturing process that I intend to use. Like are the walls the right thickness, are there undercuts, are there any unreachable cavities, etc. That said, a key aspect of this design strategy was driven by the interest to develop a model that works for both additive, like 3D printing, and subtractive, like CNC milling fabrication methods. Not to say there isn't a number of other ways you can accomplish the same thing, but this method is becoming a favorite practice for me in modeling for those mixed process objects. It just gives me more flexibility. It's worth noting that when I'm designing for a specific process, you need to consider its capabilities. For example, what are the properties of the material being used? How much additional tolerance is required? Do I need to accommodate for any shrinkage or expansion? Do the vertical walls require a draft? How does it accommodate undercuts? And will that cost more in tooling, setup, or finishing? If you don't know these answers about your manufacturing process, then you have to do some research. The alternative, which is learning the hard way, is costly and frustrating, so do your homework. For me, fortunately prototyping is usually with SLA or FDM printing, laser or CNC milling, and the main concerns of these are tolerances and undercuts. Resin and FDM require undercut supports and as a result they impact the quality and finish of the surfaces. Object design and print orientation can minimize or hide blemishes and save you a lot of time post-processing. Needless to say, resin and FDM are additive technologies, so there is no concept of changing the work holding strategy mid-print. CNC, on the other hand, being subtractive technology, is all about performing multiple machine operations to remove material from the stock, thus milling the surfaces that define the shape of the object, which almost always requires a machine holding strategy of various tools and orientations. As 3D printing is much more forgiving technology, today we'll walk through the CNC milling strategy required to create this body from a block of wood. As the body design is a one-piece hollow shell, this requires a two-sided operation to remove the material. Designing the work holding jig and the strategy are the first steps of pulling this off. For this body, the main operations will be to mill inside body cavity and then to mill the outside surface of the body. The reason why I say it like that is because Milling the inside first will allow us to hold the block of wood during this operation while it's still square. If we were to mill the outside surface first, it would be significantly more difficult to grip and hold the body, simply because none of the surfaces are parallel. It wouldn't be impossible, but it'd definitely require more work. By milling the inside first, when we flip the body, we will have a flat hold surface while milling the second side. Before designing the jig though, I'll need to decide on the size of the stock. 
The reason this is important for a two-sided operation is so that I can incorporate a shared work coordinate system zero into the jig that'll be used for both operations. So why does this matter? Well, in multi-operation milling jobs, changing the work coordinate system zero introduces the risk of error in just about all the axes. This is less of an issue on industrial grade machines while milling rigid materials, but definitely a consideration when you're milling tight specs in wood on consumer grade CNC machines. Okay, so for this body, the stock will be 160 by 87 by 35. That shape will be used to determine the size of the pocket that we use to hold the block when milling the inside of the body. Inside the pocket, I'll use double-sided tape to hold the stock material while performing the milling operations. Once the inside is milled, we'll flip the block and hold it in another pocket to mill the outside. The shape of the second pocket will be the profile of the body's face. This will almost guarantee we get a tight registration on the flip. This body, when finished, is only two millimeters thick, so if it's off by any, things aren't gonna go well. Putting the two profiles in a sketch and arranging the work coordinate system origin centered between the two profiles, I'll be able to set the zero once, and then when flipping the stock for the second side, I'll be good to go. All milling operations will reference this origin as their work coordinate system zero, or the point of origin. To mount the jig to the work table, I've added six mount holes to the sketch. I'll use a couple simple extrudes to create pockets and mount holes. The pockets are four millimeters deep in an 18 millimeter jig. Now that we have the body and jig models ready to go, let's switch over into a manufacturer section of Fusion 360 and plan our milling operations. First things first, let's mill the jig which will hold the body stock in place. The rough size of the jig is 210 by 280 millimeters, which I'll cut out of some Baltic birch 3 quarter inch plywood. We'll create a new setup and define the stock size for the jig milling operations. Next, we'll add a few 2D operations to mill the jig. For these operations, we'll configure them all to use a quarter inch three flute flat end mill using standard feeds and speeds for wood. First, we'll use a 2D pocket operation to mill out the four millimeter recessed areas that'll hold the stock in its two positions. Next, we'll add a single drill operation for the hole to be used as the work coordinate system's origin. Finally, we'll bore out the 5 8 inch holes that will be used to mount the jig to the machine. With that, we can generate the tool paths for all operations at once. And since these all use the same end mill, I'll post-process them all together, creating a single file for the machine to run. And with that, the jig is done. Next, let's prepare the first step that will be performed using the jig, milling the inside of the body. We create a new setup and define the stock size that we agreed to earlier when creating the jig. Next, we'll add rough milling operations to remove most of the material from the inside of the body cavity. Then we'll come back and perform some finishing operations to clean it up. For the roughing operation, we'll use a one quarter inch three flute flat end mill again. The first operation will be to surface the top of the stock down to the actual top of the model being produced. This removes any imperfections and preps the surface for subsequent steps. The next step is to mill four millimeters of the body profile. This will be the profile that will register the body into the second pocket in the jig when it's time to flip. Next, I'll perform an adaptive rough with a five millimeter step down. This will remove lots of material fast, but it won't look great, but not to worry. Once the roughing operations are complete, we'll run a couple operations with a 1 8 inch two flute flat end mill to clean things up. Next, we perform a steep and shallow process with a 0.5 millimeter step down. This cleans up all the rough edges and step downs. Since this is the inside surface, it doesn't need to be perfect. As long as it's the tolerance, we're good. The final internal operation is a pencil cut, used to clean up some critical mount ledges to the exact specification on the model. Next, the inside operations are post-processed, grouped by end mill type, and then saved off. So for our internal cavity milling, we have two files, one for the roughing process, using the one quarter inch bit, and one for the finishing passes using the one eighth inch bit. With the inside strategy complete, Next, we'll work on the outside. We start by creating a setup for the outside operations. We utilize the same work coordinate system at zero as we did before, only this time I had an offset to compensate for the amount that'll be sunk into the jig. Again, we start with a one quarter inch three flute flat end mill and roughing operations. First with an adaptive, then a contour cut to ensure most of the material is removed. Next, I shift gears and run a contour operation using a one quarter inch three flute ball end mill with a shallow step down to clean and finish the sloping body faces. The outside operations are post-processed, again grouping by end mill type, and then saved off. So for the outside milling, we have the two files. One for the roughing using a quarter inch flat end bit, and one for the finishing pass using a quarter inch ball end bit. All the files are generated and saved out, so I think we're good to go. Over at the machine, the jig is milled and mounted on the work. The stock is mounted in the step one pocket using Neato tape. 
The inside operations are performed, leaving a nice clean cavity that the components will fit into. For side two, the body is flipped and the outside operations are performed to rough and finish the body surface. Fresh off the mill, the body is clean and precise with minimal tool marks. The exterior finish will only require light sanding and sealer to prep it for finish. The total runtime of these jobs was about two hours per body. You can also see how the assembly will fit nicely into the new body. Hopefully this demo has showed you a few things that you can take away to produce better products. First, design considerations early in the modeling process to complement your fabrication process. And second, how do you choose the right combination of work holding and milling operations can give you good repeatable results. That's going to do it for today. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this close-up look at what goes into milling an Arcator 3 handheld body. Hopefully it can help you improve your results. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button and ring that notification bell. It'll keep you in the loop on future uploads. In the next video, we'll talk about milling the off-axis ports, which is a bit trickier, but I've got a few ideas to share. In the meantime, go build something, be safe, have fun, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building in the community. Also allow me to bring better content. Also check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there too.